Welcome back. We are on lab eight. We're talking about Z test today. And so we're going to do a little bit of review and reminder about normal distributions leading into talking about uh, Z scores. And uh, then we'll talk about the central limit theorem and how this is a important idea that l forms the basis of, of a lot of the remaining statistical tests we'll talk about in this course. Finally, we'll end with some examples of doing Z tests. And this is a little bit of a conceptual slash practical example. All right, let's start at the beginning here. So um, in previous labs, we've already talked about two things. We've talked about the normal distribution and we've talked about sampling distributions. And in this lab, we're gonna relate those things together. We're going to see that the central limit theorem shows that sampling distributions of the mean generally have the shape of a normal distribution. And so um, we can essentially use the math of normal distributions if we want to uh, when we're dealing with sampling distributions of the mean. And this is a convenient, uh, basically a mathematical convenience that we can make use of. So as part of a review here, um, what I wanna do is just quickly point out that uh, there is an analytic formula for a normal distribution. In R, we've been using functions like D norm and P norm and things like that. Um, and we never really looked at the formula for the normal distribution, which I have printed here. And it's a, it's a little small, I guess I could try to make it a bit bigger. Let's take a look at that here. Uh, so this is gonna give you the probability density for any value of X. And I just wanna point out that there is a sigma parameter here and here it's the same parameter, that's for the standard deviation. And there's a mu parameter for the mean. And X is for the particular score you're interested in. Everything else in this formula is not free to vary. We've got a pi, we've got an E, and so you basically plug your numbers in here uh, in order to um, compute what the probability of observing a particular score is, um, or the probability density. So for example, uh, if you wanted to compute the probability density for getting a score of one, when your normal distribution has a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one, uh, here would be an example of executing this formula in R and plugging in the values where necessary. So I just um, wrote it up with X, U, and Sigma. And you can take a look at how that works here. Uh, in this case, the, the density for this value is 0.2419707. And I'm just showing that uh, when you use D norm, you get the very same value because the D norm function is also uh, computing the probability density. Uh, so you could do it either way. Now, um, another thing, well, I guess it's a reminder here. We've already talked about normal distributions a little bit, but one thing that's really important about normal distributions is that normal distributions have the same shape. All normal distributions. And I want to focus on what that means, having the same shape. Uh, because there's a sense in which they don't and there's a sense in which they do. So let's look at uh, two different normal distributions. We're going to have one where the mean is zero and the standard deviation is one, and another one where the mean is 25 and the standard deviation is five. Okay, so I've just set up uh, two vectors using D norm. I've uh, got some values from negative four to four. That should be the range of values we would see for the first distribution um, centered on zero with the standard deviation of one. You know, we won't see very many values outside of this range. And I got the function to produce a hundred different values total. And then I did the same for the second one, um, thinking that we'll have values ranging roughly between five and 45 if it's centered on a mean of 25, a standard deviation of five. Oh, then I made a data frame 
And let's just, uh, I plotted it here, so let's take a look. So here's our two distributions. They're both normal distributions. The first one has a mean of zero, standard deviation one. The second one has a mean of 25 and a standard deviation of five. And it certainly looks like they have different shapes. This one's tall and narrow. This one is short and wide. Uh, however, you know, we're using different X axes here. Um, the way ggplot2 works is it's going to um, make the axes the same uh, if you do use a facet wrap, which is what I did up here. And, um, you know, what would happen if we zoomed into this graph uh, so that uh, we could get a closer look at it and we use this sort of same level of zoom, so to speak, for both graphs. We can set scales equal free x here and then we'll get graphs that look like this. So we can see that the values in the first distribution go from negative four to four and that's what the x-axis is here. And for the second one, the values go from, I think, five to 45. So we see that one here. And again, uh, it looks like these, uh, so we've zoomed in, but it looks like these normal distributions still have different shapes. And, you know, this is the, this is the sense in which, yes, it's true. This one is taller and this one is shorter. Uh, however, uh, there are some important realities uh, that make these distributions inherently the same. And so that's what we want to talk about here. So, for example, I'm going to say that the shapes are still exactly the same in one important way, and that is that the probability of getting scores in between particular ranges expressed as standard deviations is the same between these two graphs. So um, here's what I mean by that. And I've just um, made some graphs here to illustrate the point. So in the first graph, I shaded the region between one standard deviation and two standard deviation. If you remember, the mean in this normal was a zero and the standard deviation was one. So this is one standard deviation, this is two standard deviations, and this is the shaded region under the curve in between one and two standard deviations. This normal curve has a mean of 25, which you can't see here, and it has a standard deviation of five. So if we go from 25 to 30, that's one whole standard deviation, and from 30 to 35, that's a whole nother one. And this is the shaded region between 30 and 35. Both of these normal distributions have shaded regions between the first and second standard deviation. And my point is that the area under the curve in this read uh, over here is the, the relative area under the curve here. Uh, that is how much this red part is relative to the whole thing. The proportion is the very same over here. That is, if we were to calculate this uh, for both graphs, the, rel the area in the red part relative to the rest of the curve, we would find the very same numbers. And these numbers are the probability uh, that you would randomly draw a value from this distribution that is in between the first and second standard deviation. And we could use integration to do that. Uh, I did it in a, a kind of simple way. Um, and what I did was just took the data frame that has all the different values that I quickly made. And uh, for the first distribution, I said, well, how uh, let's filter that and have only the x values that are greater than one and less than or equal to two. And um, then we selected the score column and summed it all up and divided by, well, you know what, this part I think would be better to flip over to R here. 
Okay, here we are. Let's check out what I was doing. So first of all, I'm looking at plot DF. Now let's take a look at that data frame. I made the data frame to plot the two distributions. So this data frame has 200 columns. And the first 100 columns are the values that draw the first distribution. And we can see on the last column here, it says first up to the 100, and then it says second. And then we start drawing the second distribution. And uh, what I did here was for the first distribution, we're going from negative four and follow the X column all the way to positive four, right? And the mean of this distribution is a zero on the X value. And then I used the denorm function. So I submitted each of these X values to the denorm function and I produced the probability density value, uh, which I'm calling the score here. So this is the different probability density values of getting each of the different x values. And um, I think I might use this later, this z-score here. Uh, we'll talk about that momentarily. So what I wanted to do, remember, for the first graph, I wanted to add up all of the values between the scores of x and x equals 1 and x equals 2. So in this data frame, I want to go down here and start finding all the values that are greater than 1. So that's all these scores here, all the way to the ones, like I guess these ones right here. So I'm using dplyr to accomplish this goal. I filter the data frame and I say, let's only uh, look at scores where it says first here, because I'm looking only at the uh, first distribution. Um, then I want to keep only the rows where X is greater than one. So this, these are the rows where, so it'd be like line 63, these are rows that are greater than one. It would start keeping all of these. Um, but then I want X less than or equal to two. So I want it to stop and just select uh, something like these ones here. You know, the filtering operation, what it's doing is it's selecting only these rows. These all say first, they're all greater than one, and they're all less than two. And the last thing, I, or second last thing I use is select. And select selects a particular column. What I'm interested in here is not all of these values. I'm interested in the values in the score column. So if I just ran this part, I would just get those values from the score column. Um, then I want to do an add, I want to add up all of these scores. That's basically like adding up all of the values in this red shaded region. Um, and so I'll just highlight this part to illustrate that this one, one way I could do that is send that column into the sum function and we would get 1.78. So the, pro the sum of the probability density values in this case is 1.78. Well, what is the uh, sum of the probability density values for everything under this entire curve? Um, at the very beginning of this, I made a vector called first one, where I computed probability density values from negative four to four. So they're all right here. In the right here in the variable first one. And I could just add those up. 12.37 is the answer. And what I'm trying to do is take the sum of the red area and divide by the total sum, right? So this part is the sum of the red area and I'm dividing by the total sum. And when I do that, I get a value of 0.1443879. Okay, so the probability of getting a value between the first and second standard deviation 
of a normal distribution with mean zero and standard deviation one is 0.144. What I'm gonna show you is that's the same probability over here. So even though the mean has changed and the standard deviation has changed, the shape has not changed. So the probability of getting a value between the first and second standard deviation over here, which is now 30 and 35, is going to be the same. It's going to also be 1.44 or 0.144. Um, so I do that again, the same process here, except now I'm selecting rows from the second distribution and rows where the x value is greater than 30 and less than 35. I select the course score column, sum it up, and then I divide by the total sum and I also get 1.44. So with this check, we've demonstrated that the area uh, between a range of standard deviations um, relative to the total area of the curve is the same for two different normal distributions, and it's the same for any normal distribution. We can demonstrate that again using the p-norm function um, and these these values would be the analytically correct values remember these are sort of approximations to those and so I'm saying well let's find the um, uh, probability of getting a 2 or greater or I think it's greater than 2 and then subtract that from the probability of getting greater than one. So that whole thing is uh, 0.135. And we can do the same thing down here. And we get another one, 0.135. So if this is, this is a, these are fairly close values and they represent uh, the probability of getting a value in this region. And we're just showing you that it's the same probability. Okay, so this is a convenient aspect of normal distributions. Um, basically, if you have some normal distribution, let's say it's this one here, um, uh, this one over here, and it's got some mean, it's got some standard deviation, you can always basically convert it into this one over here um, and or into any other one just by modifying or translating the the x scores appropriately. So here, uh, a mean of 25, you'd want to translate that over here to a zero value. And like a value of 30 over here, uh, that would be like a one over here, right? And to convert scores like this, to cons convert scores from this distribution to this one over here or vice versa, what we need to do is called a linear transformation. And this process of converting scores from one normal distribution to another, um, typically what we do is we translate them from some distribution like this with, um, and then we convert them to the one over here, <laughs> which we'll learn has a specific definition called the unit normal or the standard normal and and uh, this process is called using z-scores so let's head into the practical section here on z-scores and um, what I'm going to say is that z-scores is a an example of doing linear transformations um, up here, I bring up the idea, or just some other examples of linear transformation. So for example, I'm from Canada and I live in the US and I strangely, you know, have a look, have a weird relationship with uh, the imperial system and the metric system. So for example, I should know my weight in kilograms, but I, I don't, and I never did. And I should know my height in meters, but I don't, and I never did either. Um, I'm kind of mixed up when it comes to temperature. So when it's cold out, I like to use Celsius in my head, but when it's hot, I like to use Fahrenheit. Um, and 
I think I'm probably still better with kilometers than miles. I mean, it's just a bit of a mess. Now, we know there's different systems like Celsius or Fahrenheit or miles or kilometers to express distances and temperatures. And we know that um, even though we have the different systems, the underlying values are still the same. So like for example, negative 40, which is very cold, is negative 40 in Celsius and in Fahrenheit. That's where they cross, that's where the systems cross. Um, and uh, you know, just because we might measure the distance between here and say Boston um, in miles versus kilometers, which are different numbers, it doesn't mean the distances are different, right? They're just linear transformations. And uh, to, I guess, get familiar with linear transformations before we do z-scores, uh, let's just look at uh, translating Celsius to Fahrenheit. So here's the formula. Let's just go down here. Um, the formula is the Celsius value multiplied by 9 divided by 5 plus 32. So, <laughs> I mean, I don't know why that makes sense, but that's what it is. It's just the... That's how you do it. So um, we're shifting our Celsius value in by a constant value. So we're first multiplying it by this, which is a constant value, and we're adding it by this, which is a constant value. Uh, w what I did was create uh, two sequences, one going from negative 50 in Celsius to positive 50, in Celsius, so that's a very wide range of temperatures. Negative 50 is super cold, and positive 50 is like really hot. And uh, I took that same sequence, multiplied by 9 divided by 5, and added 32, and that will translate all of our Celsius values into Fahrenheit. And then I just made a plot of these numbers, so we can see them here. So for example, zero in Celsius is freezing. And if we go up, it's like 32 something ish in Fahrenheit would be freezing. I said before that when it's minus 40 in Celsius, it's also minus 40 in Fahrenheit. Uh, so this line shows you how the different values of Celsius map onto the different values of Fahrenheit. And uh, all we did, we, we added constants to our Celsius values. We multiply by nine divided by five, and we added 32. So zero multiplied by nine divided by five is zero, plus 32 gives us 32 Fahrenheit. Right? Um, this is uh, also another way to illustrate that when you do things like transform a value by multiplying it by a constant and by adding by a constant, you produce a linear transformation. We can see that here, it's a line. All right, so z-scores are another example of a linear transformation. And what we do with a z-score is we express raw scores from a normal distribution in terms of how far they are away uh, from the mean in standard deviation units. Um, I mentioned this earlier that when we do this, we are converting the raw values from a normal into what's called a unit normal distribution. Here's the formula for z-scores. And the idea is for any score, you are going to subtract, take the mean and subtract the score, and then divide by the standard deviation. Uh, so this is the mean of the normal distribution where the score came from, and this is the standard deviation of that normal distribution. And there's two important parts of this formula. The, the first part, the mean minus the score part, that's a centering operation, right? If the mean is 25 and the score is 25, 
you're going to now re-express that score in terms of how far away it is from the mean. So how far away is a score of 25 from a mean of 25? It's zero away. It's the exact same score. It's right in the middle. How far away is a score of 30 from a mean of 25? Well, it's five away in the positive direction. How far away is 10 from 25? Well, it's negative 15 away. Uh, so the top part centers our scores relative to the mean. Um, and then the last part, dividing by the standard deviation, what happens there is we are normalizing or standardizing our are centered values. We're bringing the centered values into a common frame of reference or unit based on the standard deviation. So we're expressing the deviation from the mean in terms of how many standard deviations it is. Um, so for example, uh, let's say we had a score of 30, all right, and we we know that that is five above a mean of 25. And if I didn't tell you anything about the standard deviation, you know, the question is, 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 is 30 really far away from 25 or not? It's, we know it's five away, but how far away is five? We need to know something about the spread of the distribution. Um, so that is controlled by the sigma parameter in the normal. So imagine if the standard deviation was one, right? So there's here, we're now imagining a mean of 25, and there's a, a standard deviation of one for this distribution. And so how far away is a score of 30? Well, it's pretty far away. Uh, it is five whole standard deviations away. Now, if you could imagine what that looks like, I'll just scroll back up to one of our distributions. Um, how far away is five standard deviations? Let's take the opportunity to look at this reference distribution, our unit normal. Here is the mean. Here is one standard deviation away. Here is two. Here is three. Here is four. Five would be over here. Notice that it's like right off the graph. Same thing over here. Here's one, two, three, four, and then five would be over here, right? And as you can see in both cases, um, that's very far away from most of the numbers. So uh, most of the numbers are well between negative four and positive four standard deviations. And that's like 99.9999%. Now, on the other hand, if the, if the score was, uh, let's say here, um, so what happens if we're thinking of a different situation? The standard deviation could be 10. So for example, here, remember, uh, we have a score of 30 and we have a mean of the distribution of 25. So it's five away from 25. But if the standard deviation of the distribution is 10, then um, five away is only half of a standard deviation. Because the standard deviation is 10, five away is only half of that. Uh, how far away is half of a standard deviation from the mean? Not very far. When we go back up and look at our unit normal, here's one, here's half, right? So it's like saying a score from around in here or right over in here. All right, so that is a bit of conversation give, giving us a sense about um, thinking about a raw score like 30 in terms of a deviation from a mean like 25 and 
why we would want to express that deviation in terms of a standard deviation unit, like one or two or three standard deviations or half a standard deviation. It'd be useful for us. Um, and um, basically, here's a, let's see if I can make this a bit smaller. What we have here is an example of the transformation of z-scores, uh, or transformation of raw scores to z-scores. I'm imagining we have a distribution with a mean of 25 and a standard deviation of 5. And on the top, I basically just uh, have a, an x-axis describing this. So here's a mean of 25. And we can see that if you go 5 up, that's one standard deviation. You'd have a 30, and then 5 up, 35, and so on. So this is sh showing you um, what the normal distribution looks like from the raw score perspective. And if you were to convert any given raw score to a z-score using the z-score formula, uh, then you'd have these ones down here. You'd be expressing deviations from the mean in terms of how far they are away in standard deviation units. So for example, how far is 30 away from 25? If, uh, well, it's five away and the standard deviation is five. So there, that means it is one standard deviation away. Um, what about 35? Well, that's 10. It's uh, 35 minus 25, which is 10, divided by 5, right? That's the standard deviation, so that equals 2. Right, so raw scores can be converted into z-scores by taking the raw score, sub, uh, taking the mean, subtract the raw score, and divide by the standard deviation. Now one question is, uh, I mentioned earlier that normal distributions are convenient, so why are z-scores convenient? And I'll suggest that they're convenient if you know how to interpret them and if you use them a lot. Um, it's really all about using them. So for example, I mentioned earlier also that I find Fahrenheit convenient to use for hot temperatures, but um, I don't, for example, like if it's 109, I know it's hot outside, right? I know it's really hot. And for whatever reason, I just don't know how hot that is in Celsius. I could figure it out, I'm sure. Uh, but it never really got super hot when I was in Canada, so um, I guess I just don't know those numbers very well. So it's, it's not convenient for me to think of hot temperatures in, in Celsius. I just don't have the practice. Uh, I think z-scores become convenient for you if you use them a lot. If you happen to use normal distributions a lot, you'll find z-scores useful because it will allow you to think about numbers in a common frame of reference. And, and so what you'll often find in textbooks is a graph that's something like this. These are sort of intuitions you can have about z-scores um, uh, or intuitions about the unit normal distribution. So for example, we're looking at a normal distribution and it's centered on zero. So this is a unit normal. And that means this is one standard deviation. This is two, this is three, this is four. And this is minus one, two, three, and minus four. And the distribution is symmetrical. And it turns out, oh, these are just kind of like round numbers, you know, like one standard deviation away, two, three. Uh, they're no better than any other numbers, um, but they're simple and maybe easy to think about. Check out some of the common properties. For example, if you were to compute the area under the curve between this value and this value, um, so between 0 and 1, 
you get approximately 0.34. If you get an area between 1 and 2, you get approximately 1.1359, which is what we found earlier. The probability of getting a value between 2 and 3 standard deviations away from the mean is really small. It's 0 0.002, or sorry, 0.02%. So taking all of this, and those are reflected on the other side here. Uh, let's just look at a few general things. So we're seeing here 95% of values. That is like if you take some numbers out of a normal distribution, 95% of them will be between roughly negative two standard deviations and positive two standard deviations. Now the exact number happens to be negative 1.96 standard deviations and positive 1.96 standard deviations. Um, that's, that's an interesting fact to know, you know, if you got some number and it was like a 500 and someone told you, oh, that's uh, three standard deviations away from the mean. Okay. You don't even need to know what the mean is. You don't need to know what the standard deviation is. And you can already know that it's a pretty unusual number. I mean, 99% of all numbers will fall between negative 2.58 standard deviations and 2.58 standard deviations. So when you start getting numbers greater than three standard deviations, these are really unusual numbers. And we're just you know, talking about some properties of the normal distribution using the unit normal to make these observations. And if you, yeah, if you study something like this, you'll get a sense, an intuitive feel for how likely things are based on the standard deviation, how many standard deviations it is from some mean. And this is one reason why people uh, use these scores. And there's other reasons as well, but uh, here's here's one simple way. Okay, so we are on to the next part, the central limit theorem. We're going to find out through the rest of the course that many common statistics rely upon normal distributions. And so this is actually one good reason to become familiar with how normal distributions work. You'll be using them a lot later on. And in particular, one reason we use normal distributions a lot is because of the central limit theorem. I mentioned a few other reasons here, like so why are normal distributions so common in statistics? I, I'll say there's a convenience issue. Uh, you know, before we had computers, people were looking for convenient ways to do some of the math by hand. The normal provides that. Uh, and also I think there's a little bit of inertia. We don't need to use the normal distribution as we examine it further, we'll start questioning some of the assumptions about it. We'll find the imperfections about using it. And, and so, you know, one reason it's so common today is probably because they're convenient to work with. People use them and they just keep using them because that's what they use. It's just simple inertia. Um, but there are some fundamental reasons stemming from the central limit theorem. So what is the central limit theorem? I'll present this in terms of one thing we already learned about, and then I'm going to make a claim about it. So remember, we already learned about sampling distributions. And if you remember, a sampling distribution is when you take multiple samples, you calculate a statistic like a mean for every sample you take, and then you look at the distribution of the sample statistic. Okay, you get a sampling distribution of some statistic when you do that. And in previous labs, I stressed that when you do this, you can create sampling distributions for any the st statistic that you want. You can do it for a mean or standard deviation or whatever you want. And remember, we use sampling distributions for the purposes of statistical inference. We were interested in basically asking the question, well, if I was going to take some samples, I want to get a sense of what the samples could look like overall, uh, or in the long run, or over multiple attempts. 
And if you create a sampling distribution, yeah, it's, it's a window onto what could have happened. It's useful for comparing something like that to um, the information you would collect when you went out in the world and collected a particular sample. You'd be able to compare your sample to what you could have got, say, by chance alone. And if it is uh, something that is unlikely to occur by chance alone, you can rule out certain reasons for why your sample looks like why it does. Okay, so that was a reminder about sampling distributions. We've already learned about those. And here's the thing about the central limit theorem. It's the claim that sampling distributions of the mean are normally distributed. And that's basically it. It just turns out that for the most part, when you make a sampling distribution of the mean, it is normally distributed or approximately normally distributed in the long run. And so because of this, um, you know, there's edge cases where this doesn't hold, but in general, it's true. So that means you can basically substitute the math of normal distributions whenever you're trying to figure out things relating to sampling distributions of the mean. So if you want to be like, okay, I got some mean and I want to know if it's, uh, what's the probability of getting this mean or larger? We could figure that out using a sampling distribution of the mean. And if we happen to know the mean of this distribution, and if we happen to know the standard deviation of this distribution, well, we could just put those two parameters into a normal distribution formula. And then we could work with that one to figure out the probability of certain things happening. All right, there's an interesting implication here also that, uh, that makes normals very common in statistics. The implication is that even if the scores that you're measuring come from a non-normal distribution, so even if the scores you're measuring don't come from a normal distribution, it is nevertheless the case that the sampling distribution of the means will be approximately normally distributed. This is an important part. You, you don't have to be taking measurements from a normal distribution in order for the sampling distribution of the sampling means of the sample means to be normally distributed. I'm going to illustrate this one time in R. So first of all, let's imagine uh, okay, so we're going to take some measurement involving scores from a uniform distribution. That is a flat distribution. It is definitely not a normal distribution. So I do that here using R unif. I get 10,000 numbers and um, between 0 and a 100. So the minimum value will be 0, and the biggest value will be 100. And I'm just going to get 10,000 values and make a histogram. So here the values are between 0 and 100. They're all randomly chosen between 0 and 100. Each of the values between 0 and 100 roughly have a, an equal probability of being chosen. In this case, I'm just showing you that this is a flat-ish distribution. It is not shaped like this. It is not shaped like a normal distribution. It's a uniform, flat, rectangular distribution. And if we were going to take numbers out of here, right? To make a sample, like if I take 10 random numbers out, get a sample mean, and do it again, and do it again, and do it again. So for example, now, instead of plotting individual scores, what we're going to do is we're going to create a sampling distribution of the mean from this distribution. Okay, we're going to do this 10,000 times. And we're going to, for each sample, take five observations out. I'm going to compute the mean for each. And I'm going to plot the distribution of sample means. This is all being done right here. We've done this kind of thing before. What I'm doing 
10,000 different times using the replicate function is using the runif function that I used up here to draw five numbers, five random numbers from this uniform distribution that has a range of zero to 100. So it's gonna be like taking numbers out of here. We've already demonstrated these numbers are not from a normal distribution. So we take out five numbers and we calculate the mean. So now we have a mean of our sample of five numbers. And we're going to do that 10,000 times to produce 10,000 sample means. Now what will the sampling distribution of the sample means look like? We can do the histogram here to find out. And what does that look like to you? It does not look flat to me. It looks like a normal distribution, right? And this is the point of the central limit theorem. No matter what the parent distribution is where you're taking your scores from, when you take some number of scores and calculate a statistic, specifically the mean of those scores. Now we're kind of removed one step. We're thinking about what the mean of those scores could look like. If we imagine all the different ways we could have taken sets of scores out and computed a mean, we would be getting a sampling distribution of the mean. And the point is the sampling distribution of the mean will be normally distributed. It's this nifty property of the central limit theorem. All right. Um, so this looks like a normal distribution, but is it a normal distribution? How can we prove that this sampling distribution of the means is a normal distribution, or at least approximately normal. There's a few different ways we can do that. I'm, I'm just gonna do a quick and dirty minimal test. That's really not a test at all. It's just an example of getting to think about if you had some distribution, how would you know if it was normal? Remember, we pointed out before that um, all normal distributions have the same shape in the sense that the area between ranges of standard deviations is always the same. So the area between the mean, which is zero, and the first standard deviation in a unit normal with a mean of zero standard deviation of one is 0 0.341. We saw that earlier in the graph above. The area here between zero and one is 0 0.341, this area. What is the area here between the mean and the first standard deviation of this histogram? Is it, is it also 0 0.341? It should be if this is a normal distribution. So let's calculate it. What I did first is I just converted the values in sample means right here. All right, convert those to z-scores. So I took each value, I subtracted the mean, and I guess I should have done that the other way. Um, mean minus those things. Anyways, divide, but I don't think that won't matter for what we're doing here. Uh, and we're going to divide by the standard deviation of these things. We'll convert them all to z-scores. And then I'm just gonna say, well, how many scores do I have that are greater than zero and less than one? And I have 10,000 total scores, so let's calculate that. And this is a simulation, so it's gonna be a little bit off, but it's 0.33. You know, that's pretty close to 0.34. So I'm gonna go ahead and say, yeah, this is giving me some confidence that uh, this is 
approximately a normal distribution. All right. Okay, so we just did a little bit of demonstrating in R uh, about the central limit theorem to show that the parent distribution can be really any shape. In this case, we looked at a uniform and we produced a sampling distribution of the mean from that parent distribution and showed that the sampling distribution of the mean is shaped like a normal, even though the parent distribution is not. Let's move on to our final section on z-tests or z-tests if you're from Canada or somewhere else. That doesn't say z. All right, so the z-test can be used for statistical inference um, when the population parameters for some set of sample means are known to be normal. That's our first requirement. And the mean and standard deviation are also known. And I'm gonna say that these assumptions are rarely met in the real world and these facts are rarely known. And in psychology research, z-tests are not very common compared to other tests because we usually don't know if the population that we're uh, studying is no distributed normally. And we usually don't know uh, what the mean and standard deviation of that population are. So um, this is one reason why z-tests aren't used that often. But let's look at what they could do. We're gonna look at three different examples. And th in the first example, uh, we'll have an n of 1. So this is a really simple case, uh, basically where you draw one number out of a normal distribution. So let's say, for example, uh, you know that some measurement involves sampling a score from a normal distribution. And let's say you know the mean and standard deviation of the distribution. Okay, if you have all this information, you can use your knowledge of normal distributions to determine the probability of obtaining specific ranges of scores. So here's a question. So what is the probability of obtaining a score larger than five from a normal distribution with mean equals one and standard deviation equals three? You've got your score, you've got your known normal distribution with two parameters, the mean and the standard deviation. You could pop that stuff right into the p-norm function. The x value is five, the mean is one, the standard deviation is three, set lower tail to false, and that will give you the probability of getting a value larger than this. And that is 0 0.09. So there's your z-test p-value there. Um, we could do this slightly differently using z-scores. So we've got a situation with a score of 5, mean 1, standard deviation 3. Well, we could convert that to a z-score if we wanted. So um, 5 minus 1 is 4 divided by 3. That gives you... Uh, how far away 5 is from 1 in terms of standard deviations, and that's a units of 3 here. So that, that is your new x value, and the mean is 0, and the standard deviation is 1, because we're using a n unit normal here, and we get the same p-value. And if you're doing a two-tailed test where you're just wondering, what's the probability of getting a score larger than five relative to the mean here um, in either direction. So you could, you could be, I guess, okay with like a, a negative four. That would be the same difference. Uh, and seeing as these things are symmetrical, we you could say you've got a 9% probability of getting one larger than this value, you've got a 9% probability of getting a, a 
local value smaller than negative four. So it's basically times two. Um, all right. So, I mean, just to kind of summarize, when you only take one score out of a normal distribution, uh, you're, you're basically converting your score to a z-score, and then you're just asking questions about the probability of getting that z-score or larger, or that z-score or smaller, or a z-score as large or larger than that in an absolute value kind of context. Well, let's ask a different kind of question here. Let's imagine you have an n greater than one. So your sample size is greater than one. In our example, you take 10 scores from a normal distribution with mean 55 and standard deviation five. Let's just say we know we have a normal distribution. Those are the means and standard deviations. And we're gonna, we're gonna randomly take 10 scores out. The general question we should think about is what kinds of things could happen in this situation? Um, we know we could take 10 random scores out of here, get a mean, well, what kinds of sample means could we get? And, you know, we could consider things like, would a sample mean of 60 be strange? Or, you know, what, what kinds of sample means could we get? The whole, or the way to answer this question, I think, is to think about a sampling distribution of the mean. That will tell you all the different kinds of sample means you could get. And uh, we can make that in R pretty easily. So we're going to make 10,000 sample means. Uh, we're going to sample this case from a normal distribution with uh, sample size 10, mean of 55, standard deviation of five, calculate the mean and do that 10,000 times. And we get a sampling distribution that looks like this. And this is a simulated sampling distribution. You could see here's a 55 would go here. So the mean of this is uh, centered on 55. And, you know, it looks like our sample means, I'm just, we're not getting too many above 60 here. Not getting too many below 50. So if you were to take 10 numbers out of a normal distribution with mean 55 and standard deviation five, you probably get sample means that look something like this. And remember, this is not the original distribution. This is the distribution of sample means that could be attained if your sample size was 10. Okay, the original distribution has a mean of 55 and standard deviation of five. Um, one question that we have is what are the parameters of this distribution here? This is the sampling distribution of the mean. We're suspecting and we can argue that the mean of this should be 55 because on average, your sample means should be the same as the population mean. So the most common sample mean should be 55 because that is the population mean. And as you can see, that that's what we're getting here. Well, the standard deviation of the population here is a five. That's clearly not what the standard deviation is here. If we were at 55 and we go over five to 60, that that's obviously way more than one standard deviation. One standard deviation is more like around here. So I don't know, I'm, looking, I'm seeing like the one standard deviation is probably like 56 or something, 56 and a bit. I'm just guessing here. So the standard deviation of this sampling distribution is much smaller than the parent distribution. What is it? That's a good question. We need to know what it is. And well, we could just measure it from the simulation. We got all these numbers. 
we could find the mean of those numbers to be 55. We could find the standard deviation, and it happens to be 1.569. So I wasn't too far off. It's not 1, it's 1 1.5. It's around here. Okay, so by simulation, we estimated the sample mean of the sorry, we estimated the mean of the sampling distribution to be 55 and the standard deviation of the sampling distribution to be 1.56. Um, this is not a common way to do it. It works. The more common way to do it is to use the formula known as the standard error of the mean because we can compute the expected value for the standard deviation of this distribution directly. And all we need here is the sigma of the parent distribution. So the parent normal was having a standard deviation of five. The bottom value is the square root of n, which is the n stands for the sample size. And our sample size was 10. So if you do 5 divided by the square root of 10, what you get is 1.58. This is the expected standard deviation of this distribution. So we did that two ways. We wanted to know, remember, two, let's back up, there's two parameters of a normal distributions, the mean and the standard deviation. We're interested in what the mean and the standard deviation are for the sampling distribution of the mean here. We know the mean should be 55 because it's the same as the population. The sample mean should be the same as the population mean. What is the standard deviation of this? Well, that is known officially as the standard error of the mean. And we calculated that both by estimation and got 1.56. And we calculated it directly, got 1.58, basically the same number. Okay. Phew. So now we got these two numbers, right? That's all we need to be able to do Z tests. So then we can go and do Z tests if we wanted to. So what is the probability of getting a sample mean higher than a 60 if the sample had a size of 10 and if the individual scores came from a normal distribution with mean 55 and standard deviation 5? Okay, you don't actually have to go through all of the business of doing the, um, creating the sampling distribution of the mean as we did before. We can answer all of this stuff just with the provided information. For example, the score is 60. The mean is 55. And the standard deviation that we're interested in is the standard deviation of the sampling distribution of the mean. So it's not five, it's, we have to use the standard error of the mean because that is the standard deviation that we're interested in. It's five divided by the square root of 10. And that gives us a 0 0.0007. So the point here would be that if you knew that a normal distribution with a mean of 55 and standard deviation of five existed, and you took 10 numbers out of it and you got a mean of 60 or higher, I mean, that would be very strange. It ha would happen almost never, 0 0.0007 probability. In this example, I convert the score of 60 to a z-score first, relative to the correct distribution. So I use the standard error of the mean as the standard deviation. And then I submit the z-score here and I use the unit normal mean and standard deviation. Um, also, I could just look at my sample means that I calculated from my uh, simulation and just see how many of them are greater than 60 and divide by 10,000 because I simulated 10,000 numbers and I get a very small point you know, very small number, 
with three leading zeros, or sorry, four leading zeros. And it's not exactly this number because I didn't do probably enough simulated attempts here, but it's pretty close. All right, last example, differences between groups. And I'm, I'm going into this, I mean, you, it would be very rare to really use a z-test, I think, for this situation. Uh, because so many assumptions need to be at, at play, which they rarely are. But let's just consider this anyways. So let's say we have some standardized educational test. And it's r really well standardized, so it has known properties, known distributional properties. It's known to be distributed normally. And this, this can be accomplished. You can basically create tests that will have this kind of distribution. You could even, uh, let's, let's say this one had a distribution uh, that was normal with a mean of 55 and a standard deviation of five. All right. So, so most people who take this test get 55 on it. And um, based on well, let's just get a sense of this. You know, based on what we learned here, like, so this would be a 55, right? That would be the mean. So 95% of people are going to get 55, 50, 45. Um, let's go down to 40. This would be 40, 45, 50, 55, 60, 65, 70. So basically everybody is getting between 40% and 70% on this test. Like 99.9999, you know, lots. If you get better than 70 or worse than 40, like almost nobody does that, okay? Truly rare. All right, we're almost back. So fine, that's what happens in this test. But you're an experimenter, right? And you wanna determine if your special training can improve test performance. So you create two groups, you put randomly, you put 10 people into each group. One group is the control group, they get no training at all. Another group gets the training. So you expect that if your training works, the training group will do better than the no training group. Of course, you know that people can get, you know, different means on the test just by chance. Uh, so you're interested in you know, thinking about what's going on before you do this experiment. So you want to set some standards. How will you evaluate your data? What kind of evidence would convince you that your training worked and caused a difference above and beyond what chance could have produced? I'm going to suggest we can get some insight into the question by thinking about a z-test before you do the experiment. What we are trying to do is answer the question, what could chance accomplish? What could chance do in this situation? Specifically, if how could chance masquerade as um, your special training? How could it masquerade as looking like it caused a difference in the test, looking like, like making you think that your special training caused a difference even when it didn't? So we have to imagine an alternate scenario. What if there were two groups, A and B, but neither of them received any training, right? This is like a silly experiment you wouldn't do this if you're trying to figure out if your training works. You would not give both groups no training. This would be like two control groups. There is no experiment. There is only random assignment to groups. There is no manipulation that could plausibly change the test scores. So now we're thinking about what would happen here? And the question is, if we randomly put 10 people into group A 
and 10 people into group B, and make them all take the test, and then measure the mean difference between group A and B, we'd be asking what kind of differences could we observe between the mean of one group and the mean of another just by chance alone. So to figure this out, we need, you guessed it, a sampling distribution of the mean, but specifically we need a sampling distribution of mean differences for this situation. We can actually quickly make that in R. Um, what I've done here, we use a replicate function. We're going to get 10,000 mean differences. Effectively, it'd be like running this hypothetical non-experiment 10,000 times, seeing what could have happened. Here, I'm imagining taking 10 samples, or sorry, 10 observations for group A from a normal with mean 55, standard deviation 5, and I calculate the mean of that sample. This is the mean of the sample for group A. And I do that again for group B. And again, I'm taking 10 values from the very same distribution. 55 mean, standard deviation 5. And I get the mean for A, and I subtract the mean for B to, to get a mean difference. Or sorry, to get a difference between the means. And if I do this 10,000 times, I get a sampling distribution. And this is slightly different from the one that we looked at before. Before, we were just taking one sample out. And so we calculated a sampling distribution of the mean. Uh, more formally here, we've, t we've created a sampling distribution of the difference between two sample means. That would be a more complete way to say it. And so let's think about what's going on here. The mean of our test is from a normal with a mean 55. Okay, so that means that group A when we take 10 numbers out and calculate the mean, it will usually be 55, right? That, that's normally what it will be because the sample mean is most often the same as the po population mean, but it, it can be different. It, there's variability. And that also means for group B, because we took 10, 10 numbers from the exact same distribution, its sample mean will also normally be 55. Both of our samples for group A and B are coming from the same place. So what is the difference between the first sample mean and the second? Well, on average, it should be zero because both of them should, on average, be 55. And we can see that here. The average value in our sampling distribution, the mean of it, is zero, centered on zero. And of course, we can have differences between our samples. And this is giving us some perspective on just how big those differences could be by chance. And uh, the way I look at this is like, yeah, most of, the, most of the differences are between negative 5 and 5. This is like a rough statement about this. right? So you know, this is really good information as a test developer. If, you, if you, Sorry, that is a, as a, an experimenter where if you want to figure out if your training is going to make people better on some test like this, and if you did all this work in advance, um, well, th this could be helpful for you to evaluate whether your training works at the end of the day. You know, if you got a, if you train some people with your special training, and then you found that they did uh, three percent better than the group that didn't get training. Where is a three? It's around here. You know what? I wouldn't be so convinced that that wasn't just a fluke because you could get three better by doing nothing at all. Chance could produce three better pretty easily. So I wouldn't be so sure that uh, my 
special training produced the improvement. On the other hand, you know, if, if I got a bunch of people to do my special training and, and they got uh, 15% better on the test, that's, whoa, I mean, that's like off the screen. Um, there's no way that would happen uh, based on chance alone, given all of these specific parameters. All right. Um, so that that's that's a useful reason to create a sampling distribution like this. If we were to kind of go through and um, try to do a Z test for real on this, let's consider all the things we need to do. So for example, um, let's say we're interested in a 3% difference. So the ob so you run your experiment, 10 people get no training, 10 people get training. The people that got the training did 3% better on this test. How do we do a z-test for this? What we need to do is all these things. So we know that the individuals take a test and their means come from a normal with mean 55 and standard deviation 5. Great. We put 10 people into group A, 10 people into group B, and um, we assume no difference between the groups. We expect that all the test scores are random samples from the same parent distribution. So we're, we're basically being devil's advocate here and forming a null hypothesis. Um, we expect that by chance alone, the difference between the mean of group A and mean of uh, group B will have some variability. We also assume by the central limit theorem that the sampling distribution of mean differences will have the shape of a normal distribution. And we will say that the mean of the sampling distribution of mean differences will be zero because on average, the difference between two samples taken from the same population is zero. What we need to find out though, is what is the standard deviation of the distribution of mean differences? If we knew that, we could perform the z-test as we've done already. Okay, well, by simulation, we created this sampling distribution. I just asked the question, what is the standard deviation of this? We could calculate it using, uh, direct, or using the standard deviation in R, just on our simulation. We calculate that to be 2.25. Um, there's a slightly different standard error of the mean formula here. We add a square root of two on the top, uh, and I'm not going to go into why, but basically this is th a slight modification to account for the fact that uh, we're taking a subtraction between two groups of 10 here. And this is an adjustment to account for that. So an appropriate standard of the mean formula would be this one and we get 2.23, which is you know pretty close to what we got with our simulation. So now we've got the mean uh, of zero and the standard deviation of 2.23. We can pop those into our uh, p-norm function to do a z-test. If we wanted to know, is doing better than 3%, uh, something that happens off very often by chance, let's get the p-value for that and what I did here was I just converted to a z-score, so 58 is 3% better than 55. That's uh, the top part of the formula for the z-score, and we want to divide by the standard deviation. In this case, the standard deviation of our sampling distribution of mean differences. So I'm using this formula here. Put that in the bottom. And... Uh, then I just put my z-score into p-norm using a unit normal of 0 and 1 for the mean and standard deviation, and we get a p-value of 0.089. So and that's a one-tail test. You know, this is not something that happens very often by chance, but it's not improbable. 
um, also this p-value here that we found is basically the same as what we found when we just said how many scores in this distribution was greater than three. All right, that's the z-test. Uh, the next video, we'll be talking about uh, solutions to these generalization problems.